in the Isles of Bermuda. Shiny treasure awaits. Be brave, captains. Explore the high sea, build your cities, and fight the monsters in Ocean Slayers The Bermuda Chronicles. And today we'll be teaching you how to play Ocean Slayers The Bermuda Chronicles, game designed by Louis van Hoeverger and published by Vanda Games. And hello everyone, it's Stella. And Tarrant here from Meeple University. All right, let's go to the classroom. In Ocean Slayers, the Bermuda Chronicles, players are captains trying to earn glory on the high seas. Players will build ships and buildings, explore the ocean, collect gold, race to score achievements, and fight against monsters and each other, all in the aim of gaining the most victory points. Whoever scores the most points over eight rounds or by the time the fearsome Kraken is defeated, will win the game. In this video, we're using a 3D printed prototype of the game, and so the final components and colours will be of higher quality. Ocean Slayers can be played in any equal combination of teams or individuals between two and six players. And some of the particulars of setup can be seen on pages two and three. In each case, you'll first need to set up the tiles. Separate out the seven double-sided tiles which come with the game. Six of these are base settlements with different player colours, and each player should choose one colour. Any unchosen settlements are returned to the box. Also set aside this tile showing the Roman numeral V. This is the Bermuda Cave. All remaining tiles have this back, and they can be split into three piles. Those which correspond to your player count, those which don't correspond to your player count, and special buildings which have this gold border. You can return above player count tiles to the box. Go through all of your player count tiles and separate out any monster tiles. These will be the ones with the purple Roman numeral in the lower corner. Randomly add two special buildings to the monster pile and return the rest of the special buildings to the box. Now set up the map. Bermuda Cave is always in the middle. And then you'll shuffle the non-monster tiles and lay six of them face down in a ring. Equally space the player's base settlements around that ring and you'll be shown this on pages two and three. And then fill in the outer ring again with face down non-monster tiles. Shuffle the remaining tiles with the monsters and special buildings and make three face down draw decks. Players will add these tiles to the map as they explore. Lay out all the achievement cards on the A, A star or B sides, depending on what page 2 or 3 says for your player count. These are objectives which players or teams will be racing to complete for points. Place the event board, which doubles as a round tracker, with the shuffled event deck nearby. Place out the trade board and shuffle and place the deck of item cards. To the side lay out the Kraken board, face up decks of all of the matching monster cards, and all the monster minis. In the colour matching your base settlement, take your player board and all of your coloured pieces. This will include three levels of buildings, which are villages, cities and metropolises, four levels of ships, which are sloops, cutters, brigs and frigates, as well as harbours and sailors. As starting resources, take two fish, one wood, one iron and a gold. And as starting buildings and ships on your base settlement hex, you'll place one village, one harbour, and two sloops, each of which has one sailor. In the game, sailors represent lives. When a ship has no sailors left, it sinks. Every one of your buildings will be connected to a harbour, and that harbour also has place for sailors. When a harbour has no sailors, it and its connected building are vulnerable to destruction by enemies, although this destruction is not automatic. Fortunately, your base settlement hex is protected throughout the game. No one is allowed to destroy anything of yours on this tile. Players also start with three types of victory token in player colour. These are points which you begin the game with, but other players can steal those points from you by sinking your ships or destroying your buildings. Choose a first player and one of the two first player markers depending upon the type of game you want to play. If the players want the monsters to be slow, choose Kraken's Trinket, and if you want the monsters to be quicker, 
choose Poseidon's statue. Whichever you choose, it's a permanent decision which will be in place throughout the game. You're now ready to play. Ocean Slayers is played in up to 8 rounds, and each round is played in the following phases. First, an event card will be drawn and resolved, and the class of monster corresponding to this round may spawn. Next is player turns. Starting from the first player and going clockwise around the table, each player will take one turn, during which they'll move, explore, build ships and upgrade buildings, fight battles, and settle new islands, and then gather resources ready to be used on their next turns. To finish the round, any monsters on the map will move and may attack, before the first player marker is handed one step clockwise for the next round. Continue playing until the end of the 8th round, or the end of the round in which the Kraken is defeated, and the player with the most points will be the winner. So now, let's have a look at each phase in detail. Firstly, draw the top event card and place it onto this round slot, and resolve the text effect. This is a small effect which will apply to all players equally, and usually involves either gaining or losing a resource or the strengthening or weakening of a certain action for this round. Then by covering up one of these monster slots on the event board, you have activated that monster. From this point forward, when one of that monster's tiles comes onto the board, it will spawn one of those monsters. And if any of that monster's lore tiles are already face up on the board, then it will spawn one of that monster now. This could result in a battle, which you would resolve immediately, but I'll talk about battles later in the video. Once you've reached round 5 and beyond, this phase will involve spawning and attacking with the Kraken. And again, there'll be more on how that works later in the video. Next, you'll move on to the player turns. And each turn is resolved in three stages. First, explore and expand, then settle and battle, and then gather. Within each stage, you can do a variety of different actions, up to as much as you can afford and in any order. But once you've moved from one stage to the next, you can't then go back and do more actions from an earlier stage. The first stage is Explore and Expand. Here you'll use the resources that you've previously obtained to construct ships and buildings and hire sailors. You can trade to get more of the resources that you need, and you may make movements with your ships. First we'll look at upgrading buildings. With this action you can upgrade a village to a city, or a city to a metropolis. You can make multiple upgrades on the same turn, but you can't upgrade the same building more than once per turn. The costs are shown here. To upgrade a village, pay a wood and two iron and either pay a fish, or discard a sailor from a harbour or ship on the same tile as the village. Then replace the village piece with the city. The harbour remains in place, it still serves as a repository for sailors who represent the life points of that building. Upgrading a city to a metropolis works the same way at this cost. Upgraded buildings provide more dice in combat, higher production, more victory points, and let you construct better ships, which is our next action. To construct a ship, choose one and pay the full resource cost of the ship. Ships are never upgraded from one to the other, every ship is built new. Choose any hex which has the necessary type of building on it, where you'll bring that ship into play. So sloops and cutters can be built at any of your buildings. Brigs may be built only at cities or metropolises, and frigates may be built only at metropolises. Now bring your new ship onto that tile. Sloops are small commercial vessels. They're used primarily for fishing, although they can get involved in defence if someone attacks them. Cutters, brigs and frigates are all considered types of warship, and they can get involved in attacks against other players or monsters. You can construct a warship if there's a monster present, but that ship will have to fight the monster in your settle and battle phase of this turn. 
As an action for one fish during this phase, you can hire a sailor, and you can and will be doing this many times per turn. Sailors can also only be hired at any one of your buildings, so take a sailor piece and place it into an empty slot of one of your harbour or ship pieces on a hex containing one of your buildings. Here you could crew these pieces, but not this one. Sailors represent the lives of your ships and harbours. If a ship ever runs out of sailors, it sinks. And so when you construct a ship, you must put at least one sailor on it in the same turn. Harbours can be left empty, but doing so comes with more risk to the building. At any time, you may freely exchange sailors between harbours and ships on the same hex. Producing or gathering resources occurs in stage 3 of your turn, so if you need extra resources in stage 1, you'll have to trade for them. In stage 1, you can make a maximum of 2 trades, as shown on the trade board, with the game. You may also broker trades with any other player at any exchange rate, and you can do an unlimited number of such trades. In addition to exchanges for resources, players may negotiate in promises either to take or not to take certain future actions. For example, giving someone a resource if they promise not to attack you. Any such action-based promises are non-binding. The last action you can take in Stage 1 is to explore, which is to move each of your ships around the board. Each ship has a certain speed, which increases with the size of the ship. And this represents the maximum number of hexes which that ship can traverse. For each movement point, you may move to an adjacent visible tile, an adjacent face down tile, in which case you would flip it face up, or into an empty space to explore a new tile. Choose any one face down tile from the top of one of the three decks, and then place it into that space. The space must be adjacent to at least two previously placed tiles. What happens as you move depends on the tiles and other pieces you encounter. An open ocean space does not restrict movement at all. Ocean tiles may show one or two fishing locations. These don't impede your movement, but they're places where sloops can later go fishing for resources. When you first discover a floating treasure tile, gain one gold, but from that point forward the tile is treated as open ocean. These two tiles are resource islands, producing wood and iron respectively. These do not impede your movement, although you may choose to try to settle them in stage 2 of your turn. All visible whirlpool tiles are considered connected. If you're on one, you can move directly to any other visible one as a free action, not costing any movement points. But this is not mandatory, and you may choose to treat it as open ocean. When you find a monster lore tile, check the event board to find out whether that monster is active or not. If it's not active, then nothing happens. You can treat this as open ocean for the time being. If that monster is active, then spawn one of that monster on the lore. If the ship that discovered it was a sloop, then it gets pushed back to the place it came from. While if it were discovered by a warship, then that warship can't move any further during stage 1 of your turn, and will fight the monster in the battle phase. Finally, for the tiles, you may discover one of the special buildings. Some of these come with their own minis, and each is unique, so how your ship interacts with it depends on the tile. And you can find all those special rules in the rulebook. When looking at how pieces interact with each other, sloops are free to move anywhere on the board except for into an opponent's base settlement, into the Bermuda Cave, or into a space with a monster, but they're free to move into spaces with other players' ships. Warships can enter any hex except for the opponent's base settlement, but if they enter a space containing a monster, they must stop there. And if they enter a space containing any opponent's warships, then that opponent has the decision on whether to allow that player to continue sailing through, or if they'll be forced to stay and fight. The attacker can, of course, choose to stay and fight, even if the defender is willing to grant passage.
At the end of this stage of your turn, you're not allowed to have more than two of your warships on the same hex. You can temporarily have more than two of your warships on a hex, but only if you get down to two by the end of this stage. This same restriction applies at the very end of your turn. Once you've completely finished with all of your moving and construction, you'll move on to the settle and battle stage of your turn. Here, in any order, you must resolve all battles where one or more of your warships shares the space with an opponent's building, opponent's warship, or monster. If valid, you may also choose to settle on resource islands. On resource island hexes, you must resolve battles before resolving settling. A battle is resolved by several rounds of die rolling, until either one of the two sides has been completely destroyed, or until the attacker has fled. First we'll look at a player versus monster battle. Here the player has a brig, a cutter and a sloop. Sloops participate only in defence, so as it's the player attacking the monster, this sloop is ignored. From this table, determine the total number of combat dice the player brings. So here, for the cutter and the brig, the total dice is four white and a red. The monster's dice are shown below the health on its card. So for the Abyssal Lurker, two red and a white. Before each round of die rolling, the attacker, but not the defender, has the chance to flee with each warship. A ship may flee only if it has at least one movement point left from stage one of your turn, and if it sacrifices a sailor. You would then lose its dice from the battle. Now each side rolls its dice. A sword scores a hit on the opponent, and a shield defends a hit. If you roll a critical symbol, then take an additional white die and roll that. If your additional die shows up a critical symbol, then add another white die, and so on until you've rolled all of your criticals. Once you're done, each side applies damage to its opponent, equal to the number of hits it rolled, minus the number of shields the opponent rolled. Monsters suffer damage in the form of damage tokens, so in this case 5 hits minus 2 shields for 3 damage. And the attacker suffers damage by losing sailors from its warships. So here, three hits minus one defense for two lost sailors. A warship sinks when it runs out of sailors, and a monster is killed once it's taken damage equal to its health number. If neither side has been completely killed after one round of die rolls, then remove any extra dice which were gained for criticals, again give the attacker the chance to flee, and then roll again continuing this process until one or both sides have been destroyed. Whether your warships survive or not, if you defeat the monster, then you claim the rewards. Take that monster's card and keep it near your player board. This will be worth victory points at game's end equal to the health of the monster. Then gain all the printed rewards. So here it would be four fish, two wood, a gold, and an item card drawn at random from the item deck. You can gain significant points and resources from defeating monsters. At least as much as you can get from your building production, and so you'll want to make sure you have the capability to engage in these combats. If you battle against another player's warships, then it's resolved in much the same way. Each player will take dice according to the warships they have in that battle, while the defender can also add one white die for each sloop. These would be the dice for a blue attack, these would be the dice for a yellow attack. As before, the attacker has the chance to flee before each die roll, and rounds of die rolls will continue until one side has no warships remaining. When you sink an opponent's warship, gain rewards based on this table in page 12 of the rulebook. That includes resources which are gained from the supply, and a victory token which is taken from your opponent if they still have one left. These serve as a permanent trophy for which of the opponent's ships you've sunk, being worth victory points and contributing to the warmonger achievement, and provide incentive for battle. You will also attack if one of your warships occupies a space with an opponent's building, whether there are warships there or not. 
In this case, the building will also be part of the fight and will contribute blue defensive dice according to this table. When hits are landed, the defender will lose sailors either from the harbour or from the warships in the usual way, and ships will sink when empty. Once the harbour is empty, the battle will continue, and if the building suffers any undefended damage, then it is destroyed. On this roll, for example, all of the hits are defended, but in this case you destroy the building and the harbour, and the attacker gains rewards based on this table from page 13. This will include resources, either wood or iron depending on the type of island, and once again a victory point token from the opponent. During the settle and battle stage of your turn you may settle an unsettled resource island, including one that you've just conquered in battle. To settle an island, you must sacrifice one ship and one sailor. In this case, it could be either of these ships and sailors. So, for example, removing this sloop to settle by placing a village and a harbour. If there are excess sailors on the ship that you sacrifice, you can transfer those sailors to the harbour that you've just built. Now that you've settled the island, it will produce some resources in the third stage of your turn, which is Gather. In the Gather stage, each of your buildings produces the resources depicted here, based on the size of the building and the type of island it's on. Unless that island also has a monster present, in which case it produces nothing. Then each fishing space occupied by one of your sloops produces one fish, so this would be a fishing haul of three. Note that within each of these tiles, the fishing spot is owned by the player who gets a sloop there first. If yellow were to sail into here, there would be no fishing spots left for yellow. But if blue later sailed away, yellow could take this spot. A sloop cannot fish if there is an opposing player's warship in that same hex. In this case, on blue's turn, blue could fish here for one fish, but on yellow's turn, yellow could not. Once you've finished gathering, play passes to the next player clockwise. Once all players have taken their turns, it's time for the move monsters step. And whoever is the current first player has a lot of power in this step. If you chose to play with Kraken's Trinket, then that player must move each monster on the board one space. If using Poseidon's Statue, then you must move each monster either one or two spaces. Monsters cannot enter players' base settlements, and there can only be one monster per space. Monsters can move into visible tiles, covered tiles, or discover new tiles. Although when they do this, they remain face down. It's still up to the players to flip these tiles face up on their explore turns, but if you do move into a face down tile with a monster, you'll need to fight that monster first in stage two of your turn, and then, if you win, you get to flip and resolve it immediately. When a monster enters a hex with sloops, then the first player gets to push those sloops into an adjacent space not containing a monster. When a monster enters a space with one or more warships, then it immediately kicks off a battle where the monster is the attacker and the warship is the defender. The first player should remember that Fighting monsters is a great source of resources. You can use this phase to either create a lot of conflicts for your own ships, or to try to attack your enemy with the strongest opponents which they cannot beat. Once all monsters have been moved and any battles resolved, you'll proceed to the next round. Through the game, and particularly by defeating monsters and large ships, players will gain items. You may use at most one item per turn, and to activate its effect, tilt the card 90 degrees, which indicates that it is now inactive. Players will also race to complete the achievement cards. Each of these goes automatically to the first player to meet the requirements on the card. For example, first to deploy 7 warships, first to own 10 gold coins, and so on. The race for these is a critical part of your pathway to victory. After the fifth round event is resolved, the Kraken appears. Place the Kraken piece into the Bermuda Cave. It never moves from this location. From this point forward, 
players may advance into the Bermuda Cave to attempt to fight the Kraken. To be clear, although the Kraken Mini does occupy the entire hex, you do still need to move your ships into that hex. And be prepared to be thrown around by its mighty tentacles. The Kraken begins with 30 health, and the dice it rolls in combat depends on which round you're currently in. The closer you get to the end of the game, the fewer defensive dice it will hold, and the more attacking dice. Any damage you do in combat is marked with these health markers, but at the end of each player's turn or each crack and attack, it will regenerate back to 20 health. After the events have been resolved in round 6, 7 and 8, the Kraken will resolve a special attack, which targets all players' frigates wherever they are on the map. The Kraken will roll a certain number of dice, which will show the amount of hits it will do on all players' frigates. From round 7 onwards, frigates also get to defend, and each player rolls defense for their frigates individually. For this special event phase attack, criticals do not result in an extra die roll, they simply count as a success. So for this round 7 special attack, the Kraken will have rolled 3 hits, and this critical means that this defending frigate has saved one of them, meaning that defending frigate would lose 2 sailors. Again, for this special attack, roll once for the Kraken, and roll individually for every frigate on the board. Once you're done with the roll, the Kraken will also lose a certain number of lives, although will heal back up to 20 health afterwards. Across the three attacks, the Kraken will lose 3, 3 and 4 lives, meaning the Kraken's health will be down to 20 in round 8, even if no one has yet attacked it. The players do not damage the Kraken during this special event attack. Players can only attack the Kraken on their turns by moving into the Bermuda Cave. If you successfully defeat the Kraken, then take this board as a reminder of the 30 points you'll score, and the game will end at the end of this round. Otherwise, the game ends at the end of round 8. Now count up your final score. You'll score the points printed on each monster you've defeated, one point for each gold you possess, you'll score the points on any trophies that you've claimed from other players, and on any of your own trophies which weren't claimed by other players, points for each achievement that you've claimed, and the points printed in this column of your player board for each building and ship remaining on the board. The player or team, if you're playing in team mode, with the highest combined score wins. And that's how to play Ocean Slayers The Bermuda Chronicles. We are using a prototype copy of the game, so the rules and components may not be final. And do check out the project page for the game, we'll put a link to that in the description below. Thanks so much for watching! Your like and comments are much appreciated. Subscribe to see what's coming, and let us know what games you've been playing. See you next time!